let you down. And so uh, with that, let's uh, open our Bibles to the last chapter in the book of Revelation. And, uh, and we will, and I, I, I'm, I'll try to promise, we will finish this up today uh, unless there are some more questions. If you have some questions about Revelation or about things that we've talked about, uh, feel free to ask them. Uh, there's, there's one uh, little caveat with that, and that's this. It's, it's got to be okay for me to say, I don't know. There's a lot of things in uh, Revelation. There's a lot of things in the Bible that uh, we're studying hard to find, but uh, there are things that are just uh, 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 very difficult for us as human beings to understand them, especially when we get to the glories of, of the eternal state. You know, what is it going to be like in the New Jerusalem? And we can only imagine uh, what that's like. What's it going to be like to be in bodies and live in places where not only is sin gone, but the effects of sin is gone? That is uh, something that's really uh, uh, hardly explainable. Well, Revelation chapter 22 Let's uh, begin with verse 6 to the end of the uh, chapter. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that have their garments clean, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride said, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely." For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's pause for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just again want to thank you for your great love for us, your understanding of our condition of being sinful people. We thank you that you are willing to come to the cross and die and be our substitute and pay the penalty that rightly belongs to us. We thank you for this great sacrifice that you made. And we pray that 
every day that we live, that we would remember the great price that was paid, that our appreciation and, and thankfulness for who you are and what you've done would grow every day. We want to thank you for our country. We thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy. We want to uh, just appeal to your grace. And as we see uh, a lot of nonsense and things that aren't right going on, we just pray that in your grace, you would undertake and preserve the liberties that we enjoy. And so we, we just want to commit our president to you in prayer and the vice president in this election that's coming up. We know that you know the outcome. You know what's going to happen. Uh, but we just uh, appeal to you and uh, make our request in behalf of this country that the uh, uh, evil could be held back. And we just pray that we, as your children, would do our part by not participating in that evil. And so as you've uh, uh, prayed that we would not do in, in your Gospel of John chapter 17. And so we, we pray to that end. We want to commit this service to you this morning. We just pray that as we uh, look at the end of this book, that our hearts could be encouraged with the kind of God that we have, the provisions that you have made for us, and the future and hope that we have in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we pray that our enjoyment, that our uh, hope could be grounded in things that are real, not in things that are temporal. And so we uh, commit this morning to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's uh, open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 22, and this morning we will uh, try to finish this uh, uh, particular chapter and book. And, and uh, again, if you have any questions about this uh, and you uh, uh, don't have time or uh, don't want to ask outright, uh, you can write them down and just put them in the offering box and I'll, uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll find those. And so, uh, uh, this, this may, are, are there any questions in there now? I, to, to tell you the truth, it, it's not my job and I'm not used to checking the offering box. That may sound funny to some of you, but it's, it's true. So, no, no, no questions? All right. Okay, very good. The, uh, uh, all right, with uh, Revelation chapter 22, we have, uh, and I've uh, just put together a little, a little review chart right here. So if uh, this picture here is, uh, looks a little washed out, so I'll leave it in the back. It's a little crisper in, in, the, uh, in the back there, but uh, here is what we have. We have the first coming of Jesus Christ. And uh, that happened at what we, a couple thousand years ago. We celebrate Christmas and Easter uh, are the two, uh, uh, what, what would we say, Christian holidays that commemorate the first coming of Jesus Christ. At Christmas, he became flesh and dwelt among us for the very purpose of growing up and being that perfect mediator who died on the cross to pay the penalty of sin. Uh, three days after he was crucified on the cross, he rose from the dead, and he is now seated at the uh, right hand of the Father of God, and he's called in Scripture the first fruits of the resurrection. First fruits, uh, the whole idea is, is that there is going to be some resurrections that follow. And one of the things we've noted at Easter time before is this, is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ literally guarantees your resurrection. So that's something that we have to look forward to. Well, following the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we enter into a new age. We call it the church age. And as we think of uh, this particular uh, church age, uh, John, in Revelation, writes to the church. 
In fact, this whole book is written to the church. And in chapters 2 and 3, he actually evaluates the seven churches. And I believe as we, if, and we didn't take the time to look at those evaluations, but they're important, and I think they are a very good guide to evaluate us today. And in fact, in every one of those churches, we have people that are guilty uh, in any single church of the things that are mentioned in all seven churches. And so we can learn a lot, the church can, from the evaluation report that is given to uh, John concerning these churches. And then what John is to do is to write what he saw, and here's the outline of the book, he writes what he saw, he then writes what is, that's the evaluation, and then he's to write the things which are to come, the future. And he's to write this to the church. And so for the next uh, 20 chapters, well, it'd be, what, 18, got to subtract the, uh, the first three, um, we have future events. And the primary event is this tribulation time period right here. And John explains the judgment that is going to be poured out on this earth. We saw the uh, seven seals, and in the seventh seal, seven trumpets came out. And, uh, and then the seventh trumpet announced the seven bowls. I, I should mention that this church age here ends with the rapture. The rapture hasn't happened yet, so we are somewhere uh, in here. Uh, I think we're pretty close, but what do I know? Um, I'll put it this way. I hope we're close, all right? Uh, God doesn't tell us when he's coming. What he does tell us is this. I am coming, and I want you ready. And, uh, and that's, that's our great hope, what we're looking forward to. Well, following that, the world is judged, and Israel is also judged and prepared to for her kingdom. One of the interesting things about Revelation is this, is that the kingdom is barely talked about in Revelation. In fact, after the tribulation, he says this, and, and he tells us that there's a thousand year reign. We know that. We know how long it is. And, uh, and he then tells us after this thousand years, Satan will be released. And so at the end of uh, this uh, uh, tribulation time period, in the seventh bowl judgment, one of the things that happens is Jesus returns, destroys the enemies at Armageddon, but he uh, throws the anti or Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire, and then he takes Satan and binds Satan for a thousand years. Now I know there's those theologies that believe that Satan is bound right now. Folks, that isn't what the Bible says. In fact, the Bible says that today Satan is seeking like a roaring lion who he may devour. Uh, today, Satan is trying to blind the eyes of people from seeing the gospel of light, seeing the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, furthermore, let's, let's use our heads. Is there any evidence that Satan isn't alive and doing well? Uh, if, if there is, I haven't seen it. And, uh, and I would say that uh, Satan, who is called the God of this world, is pretty much having his way uh, with the direction that things are moving. Well, during this kingdom time, Satan will be bound. And at the end of the thousand years, uh, Satan will be released and he will lead a revolt against the king and against the city of Jerusalem. Jesus Christ is going to destroy them all. 
And, and as we think of uh, what follows that, there will be a final judgment. And this is talked about in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. It's called the Great White Throne Judgment. And in that Great White Throne Judgment, the books will be opened. And every mouth will be stopped. Because the world, the unbeliever, is going to know that they deserve the lake of fire. And the believers, and I hope you're included in that, are going to, I believe, be observers. And we're going to see that. And it's going to be a very somber time when we see the souls of those who have rejected Jesus Christ get cast into the lake of fire forever. But not only are the souls going to be cast into the lake of fire, Satan will be cast into the lake of fire and then the narrative moves from the tribulation time period to this final judgment to the new heavens and the new earth. And what's interesting is that Revelation doesn't talk much about the new heavens and the new earth. But it does talk about the new Jerusalem. And as it gives us its sizes, and, uh, and this is one of those uh, things that is so fantastic that none of us can really describe it. It's indescribable. So one of the things that we noted is that uh, God tells us what is not going to be there to help us appreciate what this place is like. And we uh, saw that in chapter 21, uh, and I'll read uh, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And so uh, in verse 4, we have a list of things that will not be present in the New Jerusalem. Now, if we really think about that seriously, uh, if these things are not present, this has got to be a wonderful place. And, uh, and God uses this to help explain. Uh, he goes on uh, to explain the New Jerusalem. And in the rest of chapter 21 the bulk of that chapter is used to uh, uh, describe this new Jerusalem right here. And, uh, and the first five verses of chapter 22, which we've uh, taken a look at in the past. And then the narrative ends. And in verse 6, you can just kind of imagine, John is standing there and he's gotten this whole thing laid out for him, and that's it. And then there's the epilogue. And then there is, okay, uh, what does this all mean uh, to you, John, and to the church? And John is writing this to the church. And it's God's intent that it wasn't just those seven churches those are representative of the whole church age. This is for us, folks. And he says uh, in, this, uh, in this particular passage, and he gives us some uh, real reminders of uh, what he said. And I, I, there's some reminders, there's some uh, assurances. Uh, this time, this, this let me uh, uh, get my... Uh, Notes out here, okay, we've got reminders. And with those reminders, we have some assurances and we also have some warnings uh, that go on. Uh, some of the reminders uh, that, uh, and when I say a reminder, what I mean is things that he's already said in the book. And a couple weeks ago, we took some time to, to ask the question, why is it that we need to uh, repeat things. Why is it that the Bible repeats so much? And I'll just give you three basic uh, reasons. Uh, there's more, but uh, one is to aid in learning. And uh, the book of Psalms is a tremendous example of that. 
uh, uh, the uh, don't walk in the uh, ungodly, in the ways of the ungodly. Well, let me put it another way. Don't sit with the scornful. Uh, he repeats it in a different way. And it helps us get the point. And uh, the book of Psalms is, is full of that. So one, it aids us in learning. Repetition is good. And if you're a school teacher here, or ever been a school teacher, you know that you have to review to make the point uh, come across. Uh, uh, the second reason, it's to give emphasis. I think we went back and looked at the book of Exodus where uh, God is describing what's happening to the children of Israel in Egypt. Uh, and there's a population explosion. And he used five descriptions in Exodus to uh, make and emphasize that point. And they all basically said the same thing. But by the time you're done with that verse, you know exactly what he's talking about. And it also, uh, a third uh, reason that I've got here is to uh, just to stir us up, to help us remember we are forgetful people. And, and with that, let's uh, turn to a, uh, a passage that we did look at. We actually looked at some verses in Psalms in the past, but uh, we won't take the time to do that right now. But in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, did I say uh, 1 Peter? I meant 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, verse 12. And Peter writes this. He says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Peter is not being bashful to repeat himself. And he says, Though ye know them and be established in the present truth. And to be established in something means that you've got a, a, a basic understanding of it. It's not that you just know it. You have some understanding. And guess what? That didn't deter Peter one bit. He says, I'm going to put you in remembrance of things that you already know, of things that you already understand. I am going to, to, to do this. And uh, the Apostle Paul mentions the same thing, uh, that uh, he will... Come and review things for them. If God wills, if the time allows, he is going to remind them. And so we, we need that. And I, I uh, uh, couldn't help but think, uh, you know, why is it that we're often reluctant to review? And oftentimes the answer is, well, you already know that. We already know that, so we don't have to go over that again. And uh, the other thing is, is that uh, 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 it gets boring, doesn't it? Come on, we want new stuff. We want exciting stuff. And, uh, and let me remind you of a couple principles. One is this. We never know as much as we think we know. And when we fail, have you ever noticed this? When we have little failures in our life, it's never in some exotic doctor in some place or eschatology. It is what? It's right in the basics. It's right in the basics. Uh, you ever lost your temper? Oh, that's because you haven't dug out what the seven thunders in Revelation is all about. If you'd have known what the seven thunders were, you'd never lose your temper. Are you kidding me? Uh, it's in the basics that we need uh, to be reminded. And so we never know as much as we think. We never know uh, uh, basically what they have. So uh, in wrapping up this book, I would like to just go through some reminders uh, from the book of Revelation. And I've listed 12. You're thinking, oh no, 12. <laughs> Dinner's cooking. I'll go through these as quickly as I can and we'll, uh, we'll make it. So back to Revelation uh, chapter uh, 22, the last chapter. And as we think of reminders and things that we can learn from this right here, in Revelation 22, 
The first thing he says are these sayings are faithful and true. Uh, and as we stop and think, well, what can we be reminded about that? Did you know that twice earlier he has used this same phrase, uh, faithful and true? Uh, just look back at 1911. 1911 says this. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Uh, look at 21, verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And here in 22, he, uh, verse 6, uh, in his epilogue, he says, these sayings are faithful and true. And so what we have are uh, a reminder of the nature of Scripture. We also are reminded of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Uh, look at verse 7. Behold... I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And as we think of Jesus Christ coming quickly, uh, what does that mean? Well, uh, we know that time to us, uh, you're coming quickly? Uh, let's see, is that in five minutes or ten minutes? Uh, time doesn't mean the same for Jesus Christ, but it does mean that this isn't going on forever and that this could happen at any time. It could happen today. If you uh, take a look at the emphasis of this quick return of Jesus Christ, we, we see in uh, verse 6, uh, at the end of the verse, it says, And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Now, John is living well before the uh, tribulation time period. But what's he say? It's shortly going to be done. Same, same concept. As we look at verse 10, we read, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Uh, what is the time is at hand? Well, it's kind of a way of saying this could happen very soon. Uh, we look at verse 12, and, it, and we read, And behold, I come quickly. We look at the end of the book, at, at, or in verse 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. And amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. And uh, this should be our response to him coming quickly. And so we're reminded of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We're also reminded, let's go back to verses 8 and 9, of the object of worship. And uh, in verse 8, what do we read? And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. Uh, and I just noted that uh, while he fell down to worship at the feet of the angel, it doesn't exactly say he was worshiping the angel, but you know what? That didn't matter to God. It didn't look right. It didn't look right. And God is, does, he's a jealous God, and he doesn't even want us to appear that we're worshiping something other than him. So he fell down in front of the angel, which showed me these things. Now, I think he probably was paying some homage to the angel in this particular verse, and, and that kind of bears out in verse 9. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. 
And as we stop and we think of, of the angels, why were angels created? They're servants. And they are to serve God. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to serve God. We have a different capacity, but the object is the same. And the angel in this verse, the end of verse 9, says this. Worship God. God is the only object of our worship. And we've taken some time in the past to uh, kind of define that word worship. Uh, it should be pronounced worthship. We're recognizing the worth of something. Now, it's kind of awkward to say worthship. If you say that kind of fast, it kind of gets you tongue tied. So we just shorten it to worship. But when you see the word worship, we're recognizing the worth of something. And listen, you cannot worship if you don't know anything about the object that you're worshiping. You, you with me on that? I don't know anything about God, but I'm going to worship him. Well, how can you recognize his worth if you don't know anything about him? And the more we know and learn about Jesus Christ, the more value, the more worth we, sh we see in our worship it becomes more and more meaningful as we grow in grace. Well, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, uh, don't let the events lead you astray. I, I kind of wrote that down. And, and uh, in the uh, uh, book of Revelation, how does the Antichrist get people to follow him? It's through deception. It's through miracles. It's through the events around us. And, uh, and yet, we see it today. And Paul warned us, don't worship the creation. You worship the creator. And that's a mistake. And we see it today. And I, I might just say that as Christians, we should be good stewards of the earth. But I want to remind you of something. The earth is God's creation. We don't worship creation. We worship the creator. He is the one where it's at. Uh, should we take care of his creation? Absolutely. Should we take care of each other? Yeah, we're created. But our worship belongs to God. Well, let's move on. Uh, we are reminded something about the nature of the book. Uh, and so let's read on in verse 10. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And as we uh, take a look at the book of Revelation, this book is to be an open book. There shouldn't be any secrets here. Uh, all of us are what? Encouraged. In fact, we're told blessed is the one who reads and understands what's going on. And God wants us to know what's going on. And so the book of Revelation is a book that can be understood. It's a book to be left open. And I know there's a lot of people that say, oh, Revelation, that is so hard. Uh, we, we, we can never study the book of Revelation. Well, that's not what the book says. And that is not what God has to say about it. Well, let's, uh, let's move on. Um, it also reminds us of something about our eternal state. Verse 11, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And as we uh, stop and we think of uh, um, the eternal state, John has an interesting uh, passage about that. And basically what this verse is simply saying is this. Listen, sinner, if you die outside of Christ in your sin, you will be in your sin for all of eternity. There is no, there's a great goal fixed. And you can't, after you know, uh, 100,000 years, uh, you've paid for your sin in hell, so now God will let you into heaven. Uh-uh. This is very serious business. But if you die in Christ, you have the righteousness of Christ 
imputed to you, and guess what? You will be righteous for how long? Forever and ever and ever. And so we, we have a picture of that. Turn with me, if you would, to John. This is an interesting uh, uh, passage right here in John chapter 8. And in John chapter 8, uh, Jesus Christ has this to say. And I, uh, we need to pay attention to this. And, and in verse uh, 24, Jesus is talking and he says, I said therefore unto you, and he's talking to the, to the Pharisees, the religious crowd. He says, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Really? Uh, isn't that kind of what chapter 22, verse 11 of, of Revelation is saying? You're going to die in your sins. Listen, uh, look, look with me at, uh, turn back to John 3, a uh, familiar passage. And uh, following John 3, 16 and verse 18, John, or Jesus says this, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Look at verse 36 of chapter 3. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Listen, folks. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid for your sin. And if you reject that payment, guess what you're saying? I'm going to deal with my own sin. Oh, really? You are going to pay for your own sin? You know how long that's going to take you? Forever and ever and ever, it'll never happen. What Jesus Christ did for us on the cross is so amazing that we can be forever righteous if we trust him. And he gives it to us by his grace. Well, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, and uh, uh, we looked at uh, John 3. Uh, the justice of God at his return. Let's go back to Revelation 22, and in verse 12, he says this, <clears throat> And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Now we noted that in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, uh, and we won't read that whole passage, but it talks about at the great white throne judgment, the books will be opened. And your life is going to be opened if you're an unbeliever. And it's going to be proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are guilty and you'll be cast into the lake of fire forever. And as we stop and we think of, of uh, is God doing that today? No. We live in this age of grace we live, and what does that mean? Does that mean God doesn't care about sin? Not, not at all. That has nothing to do with it. God is willing to give us what we don't deserve to have. And we live today in what's called a, the time of long suffering. God is putting up with a lot of nonsense. But listen, there's a day coming when this long suffering God is going to say, justice will prevail. And it's, uh, it's something that we as Christians should, should take seriously. That's why it's a reminder for us in this particular book. Well, we also have a reminder of the nature of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 13. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And this is kind of interesting uh, as we stop and we think of... and I. I have a hard time with, uh, with, you know, picking out just the right word, but Alpha, he's the creator. Everything started with him, but he also is going to wrap it up at the end. He is the 
uh, culminator. Maybe that'd be a better word. The consummator. He's the beginning. He's the end. He has everything uh, uh, in between. And I might just say that when you are born again, you're given a new, you become a new creature in Christ. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. I believe that's the start of the newness that is going to be culminated in us in the new Jerusalem. And, uh, and that's why it's so important for us not to get all wrapped up with the old, the things that are going to pass away, but rather get excited about our future, which is going to last forever and ever. We have something to really look forward to. Well, let, let's go on. We also are reminded of the condition of salvation. Let's take a look. Verse 14 says, Blessed are they that have their robes clean, or their garments clean, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into this city. Now let me uh, ask you this question. How is it that you have clean garments? How is it that you can be clean? And, uh, uh, well, you might say, well, I've just got to go home and straighten up and just live, live right. And if I live right and clean myself up and, and I, you know, look good, uh, I, oh, that's a little harder for some of us. But, uh, you know, if I, if, if I do my best, maybe, maybe I can be clean enough to make it. And yet, as we stop and we think of, of uh, what cleans us, you've you got to look back. Revelation chapter 7, keep your finger in 22. And in Revelation 7, verse 14, here is what we uh, read. And he said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, this is Revelation 7, 14. These are they which came out of the great tribulation. And listen, and have washed their robes, how they get washed, and made them white in what? The blood of the Lamb. You know, there's nothing we can do to make ourselves righteous. There's nothing we can do to clean ourselves up. But Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross, his shed blood can wash our sins away. And that's very important uh, for us to, uh, to remember. Uh, we're also reminded that salvation is available now. Now keep in mind, John is getting this whole revelation during the church age. He's on the Isle of Patmos and he's taking this message back and here is what he says to the church as he wraps it up. Verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. You know, that is, in the present, it's right now. And what John is saying, listen, I've told you what's going to happen in the future. I've told you why it has to be that way. I've told you about the righteousness, the justice of God. I've told you how you can be clean right now. Now, you know all that, don't you? We went through the book of Revelation. Come. You can come. And we come uh, by faith. This is a, a wonderful uh, bit of a reminder that God's grace is available to one, to all, right now. And uh, uh, there's nothing like a study on the future judgments of God that should trigger our need for a Savior uh, like, like a book like this. Well, let's, uh, let's move on, and we'll take a look at the 10th. And the 10th one is the seriousness of tampering with Scripture. Let's, let's take a look. Uh, in verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. 
Now, he is specifically talking about the book of Revelation. But I want you to know, the book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible. And it is faithful and true, and so is every word. In fact, as we look back and think about, uh, remember that review on faithful and true? Did you know that the other passages talk about it's Jesus Christ who is faithful and true? And his word is faithful and true. And the same thing is applied to both people. Uh, Jesus Christ is as trustworthy as his word is trustworthy. We can bank on it. And here we've got, if any man tampers with this uh, prophecy of this book, if any man shall add any things, uh, anything to these things, God shall add Unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Listen, folks. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If you tamper with the word of God, guess what? You have just missed the object of worship. You've missed the object of your faith, and your destination is the lake of fire. Uh, that's what he's talking about. Look at verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And, I, and just uh, thinking about this right here, um, uh, in these uh, passages right here, uh, I was thinking, who adds to scripture. And you know, we go back to Jesus' time and, and what did they do? They took their traditions. In fact, Jesus had to chew them out for their traditions uh, and put them on par with the scripture. They added it to the scripture. And I would suggest to you today that religion is guilty of adding to the word of God. In fact, any time a person says this, well, you've got to believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again, but you also have to do the best you can. Really? Where does it say that in the Bible? Well, it, it, it doesn't say that exactly. It says it's not of works. I know that. And it says it's not by works of our righteousness, but by his mercy. I, I know that. But it only makes sense that you've got to do the best you can. It only makes sense that you've got to, you know, be a pretty good church member, doesn't it? But you have to believe, too. So let's add to that. And what's the Bible say? Don't do that. And then we take a look at, well, who subtracts from the book? And we've got a whole group of liberals today who scoff. Oh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, that you can't take that serious. In fact, I don't even believe that Daniel wrote Daniel. That was just inserted after the fact because nobody could be that accurate about the future. Are you kidding? God wrote the future. He knows the future. What are we surprised about? And, uh, and yet, the liberals today are taking away and shredding the Scripture. Listen, folks, don't add and don't subtract. Every word. In fact, just look back at, at verse 6 and look what it says. It says, these words or these sayings are faithful and true. It's not just the concept is true. It's the words are true and faithful. And that's a, a very uh, important uh, uh, concept that we've got to grasp a hold of. The word of God, let it speak. Let it speak to us in the words of the scripture. Uh, and then we have in verse 20, uh, number 11, the hope of the church. And here's what we, we read. He which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. And as we think of the blessed hope that we have. Um, I uh, put on the wall here, Titus 3, 7. We could look it up, but I printed that out. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs 
according to the what? The hope of eternal life. Listen, our blessed hope is not in this election. And I, I, I won't tell you who I hope wins, but I really hope this election turns out one way. <laughs> I'm going to be very disappointed if that other guy wins. But my hope is not in Washington. My great hope is in Jesus Christ who is coming again and taking me out of this mess. That is the bottom line of the, uh, of the gospel right here. And so we're reminded of the great blessed hope of the church. And, and what does, uh, what does uh, uh, John say? Amen! At the end of verse 20, even so, Come, Lord Jesus. He's looking forward to Jesus. We could look up passages where the Apostle Paul is looking forward to Jesus Christ coming, waiting and looking for his return. Uh, Peter, the same, the same thing. Well, then we have one verse left, number 12, and then we'll be done. And we have a reminded of the sustenance for the church. Let's read verse 21. The grace, and I emphasize the word grace because there it is right there. God's grace. God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And I want you to know that, that we can face each day with confidence. And as we think of the meaning of the word grace, it's not because you're so smart. Now, some of you are so smart, you even look smart when you're sleeping. <laughs> some of us, we don't look smart when we're trying. <laughs> but it has nothing to do with us. Grace has everything to do with God giving to us something we cannot earn, something we don't deserve to have, and God's grace gives, and it just keeps on giving. All these promises that he's done for us, all the little blessings and time that we can enjoy, do we deserve any of it? You know what our response should be? Our response to the grace of God can only be one thing, in fact, in Hebrews 13, it's called the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Really? Thank you, God. Thank you. How can I ever repay you? You can't. You can, you, you can do nothing to get what I want to give you. You can do nothing to pay for it, either before or after. Would you just say thank you? On the wall, we have Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. What is the gift of God? Well, in the grammar, it's salvation by grace through faith, the whole thing. In other words, God gives us salvation, not because we deserve it, but all we, all we need to do is respond to him in faith. You mean, when the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? In fact, at the feeding of the 5,000, uh, what did the people ask Jesus? He, the, they said, what must we do to do the works of God so we can get this eternal food? And Jesus said this, believe on him whom God hath sent. The Apostle Paul said to the Philippian jailer who asked, what should I do? And I might just say, that is a very human response. We got to do something, don't we? Don't we? Come on. You can't just sit there. And what did Paul say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You see, salvation's a free gift. 
And if you worked for it, it wouldn't be of grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work and grace is no longer grace. Romans chapter uh, uh, 9 verse 6. I think that's the verse. All right. Uh, grace is grace. And it's what sustains us. I hope that as we live each day, the grace of God will appreciate that as well as who he is and what he's done for us. He did it not because we deserved it, but because he loves us. What manner of love is this? For God to give us something we could never, ever earn on our own. That's the gift of salvation. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your grace. We thank you that we have a future, we have a hope, and as we think of all of these warnings that you have given us, we pray that we would just take uh, comfort in the fact that what you tell us is faithful and true. And we pray that we'd be willing to bank our eternal destiny on what you tell us is true. So we thank you. We thank you for the study that we've had together. We just thank you for uh, your willingness to uh, open this book and let us get a glimpse into the future. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So remember this, as we think of God's grace, it's never ever what we can do for God, but always and forever what he has done for us. Thank you, you're dismissed.